uh, very much like to welcome Professor Anne-Marie Hill, who uh, we are so lucky to have you, Anne-Marie. Uh, <laughs> you're so knowledgeable and expert in falls management and you're right here in WA. So I know that you're going to talk about patient education, uh, so I'll uh, let you carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. And of course, uh, where would we want to be anywhere else but in the West? So um, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? So it's, it's lovely to see you all online, everyone today. I see everyone's names and see people that I've met at different places and seen some of the fantastic things actually that everyone's doing. Um, I'll just share my screen and hopefully you're noticing it now and no problems with that. I'll try no to, oh good, thanks Sue. I'll try to talk only for about 30 minutes if I can, or 30, you know, just over 30 minutes. So there's some time for any Q&A to develop. And as always, um, I'm always happy to discuss things afterwards and very happy to, um, uh, if we can set up any sorts of times that, are, that fit with it, you know, always happy to have a bit of a meeting with someone or have a chat. So uh, please feel free to follow up. Um, so I am going to talk about patient education and hopefully it will be um, some new information. I think a lot of you will be fall specialists and will know a lot about it yourselves, um, but hopefully I can draw some new insights together for you or just give you some ideas and ways of looking at things. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the lands of the Noongar people and um, say Kaya Wonju Noongar Budja, um, welcome um, to Noongar country and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of um, this land in Perth and uh, to all elders past and present and acknowledge the tremendous contribution that Aboriginal people have made to particularly the health of WA and the health and well-being um, of um, departments of health over the years. And they have had some marvellous contributors, um, as we would all know. So uh, is it important to think about falling in hospital? Now, I think you will all agree with that, uh, that it is important. Um, but I do think that it's um, good for us to keep a contextual view. And sometimes, uh, even though we get so immersed and thinking about the safety of our patients and good care and making sure they recover well, um, that importance doesn't always strike uh, students or, or brand new graduates or um, people that may not work in the area that's a bit more focused on older patients. So I think it's always helpful to um, think about that when you're doing it, your education or talking to patients that sometimes you're coming to a completely um, somebody who has never thought about falling and uh, that's the one thing we'll talk about with patients too in particular with patient education so we'll we'll have a talk about that. Um, as part of this talk I'll be presenting some new and as yet unpublished data so when I send you the pdf of the slides I'm sorry but I'll have to remove some of the slides and I'll just kindly ask that you don't share the slides verbatim with people um, the ones that I'm talking about today, you'll see the ones that are missing afterwards when I send them to you, just because we're in the process of now um, analysing all these data. So um, you are in the fortunate position of hearing some uh, brand new data. So just in, in that view of if you're trying to explain to somebody how falls happen or why they happen, this is a good... Um, uh, slide, I think, in terms of just saying, you know, once people get over that age of 64 or so, then you can see the escalating rates of falls in hospitals by older people. And I think that just cites it nicely for people that we're working generally with older patients when we talk about falls. And a very interesting, I think, piece of data is that yearly hospital falls are estimated to cost the US healthcare system $34 billion. So I think that really gives a, a serious sort of a, a, a gravity to the, to the problem that we're dealing with and how it is a, it is a big problem. 
Okay, so I, I, you know, are our patients at risk? We're always talking about risk, and I think uh, there are a couple of pieces of information that are helpful to have again in a very simple approach when you're talking to patients. Um, the biggest indicator of being at risk of falling, as we know, is if you have had a fall. One of the issues is that falls are higher, are happen at a higher rate in hospital than in the community. So they really are a different, uh, happen at a different frequency. And I think that's something that even as hospital staff, we don't always appreciate. The other thing that I think is important to bring up to um, patients and staff is that we know from very good data, both in WA and nationally and internationally, that about three quarters or more of falls happen when patients are alone. And to me, that is always the single biggest argument for education, that falls happen when patients do something and they are by themselves. So they have made some kind of decision. And I'll keep that thought and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when you talk about people being at risk of falls, I want you to think that in Australia in one year, there were about a quarter of a million older people admitted because they fell. So they walked in the door of the hospital and they met that criteria immediately. Have they already had a fall? Yes, they just have one. They've just been admitted for that. So the red flag should be just flying very strongly already. This is a person who's just fallen. They're at very high risk of falls. So if we ask how many older people who come to hospital have had falls in the past 12 months, it will be a high number because if they've got chronic diseases and other problems, they've probably had a fall. And if we look at falls, um, this slide I won't spend a lot of time on, but you can see that we're spending about nearly $600 million a year trying to prevent falls. So this is fantastic work done by my, by my colleague, Terry Haynes, who, who uh, has worked with me with WA Falls data at length over the years. And you can see that we're spending quite a lot of money on different uh, resources and other resources. And I guess what we want to say is not so much that money is the only thing that's important, but we want to say, we know we have a finite amount of money. Are we spending the money in the most useful way possible? So if we're spending $590 million and we know that roughly 50% is going on these kinds of tasks, are they, if they were reducing falls, fantastic but are they? We've recently done a systematic review, uh, which as part of a partnership grant, NHMRC partnership grant that I was CIB on, and we've um, published this uh, recent, this, this systematic review, and it's been very well received, and I think it shows again the area of interest there is in falls prevention. Um, when you look at, um, studies that have used assistive devices. Um, so if you look at Sohota with bed alarms, Bisvanathion with um, uh, Ambigem um, wearable sensors, Mayo with um, falls risk alert bracelets. Um, the interesting thing about these is they don't show any evidence of effect. Um, you know, there's been several large trials, one conducted by my colleague Ron Shaw, who's visited WA and has been heavily involved in, in all my research. Ron is a very preeminent falls expert in the United States. Ron's done one of the best worldwide studies there is on bed alarms to show that they don't have an effect. When you look at patient education, um, patient education um, has shown that it does effectively reduce falls rates when provided on wards in addition to usual care, in addition to the range of multifactorial strategies that wards are doing. And both these trials, which is not, you can't always say this when you're doing talk, but for us, we can say both these trials happened wholly or partly in Western Australia. 
So these results, whether we want to say they're generalizable worldwide, it could be different in England or the US because hospital systems are different. But these trials have happened, these high quality trials in our own health system. So that's a very strong reason for taking some of this evidence on board. It's happened in our own setting. And you notice that that's been recognized in the New World Falls guidelines that came out earlier this year. Um, because the, there are three recommendations in the World Falls guidelines for hospital falls, uh, performing a multifactorial risk assessment, providing education for older patients and other high risk groups, so younger people with serious chronic health conditions, and implementing uh, personalised multi-domain falls prevention strategies based on a personalised risk assessment. And you can see the grades of evidence there and that education for patients receives grade 1A evidence. It's the only evidence for hospital falls that receives that level of recommendation. So I think that just does tell us that this is something that we should look seriously into. It's something that we should be implementing. And when I say implementing, we should be implementing and evaluating how it's working and how successfully are we implementing the programs that we're doing for patients. Our program that um, we used across eight wards here was provided for patients with better cognition. So not people who had no cognitive impairment, but the individualized patient education we gave as part of the trial um, in WA um, that was in the meta-analysis, we provided it to patients who had a level of ability that was any only minor cognitive impairment. So they had to score over 23 on 30 on a mini mental or seven on 10 on AMTS. And it included sessions, uh, one to three sessions, and included showing people a short DVD. And importantly, it included an interactive, personalised learning approach to the people we approached. And importantly for this trial that significantly reduced falls is it reduced falls throughout the wards. So even people with cognitive impairment fell less on wards where that education was provided. And you can see that that's a very serendipitous finding because what it says is once patients know how to behave safely and staff follow those kind of prompts from patients and there's an, and there's an interaction between patients and staff, it means that that overflow effect spills over into other patients on the ward, even with those with cognitive impairment through staff actions and practices. So it's a really good example of how a culture of safety protects the least people able to protect their safety. So it's, it's a, was very good in that sense. But why is it so challenging? I think that's an interesting point when we talk about patient education. When we've done that first trial, and we have been looking at this in Melbourne as well and Sydney and other places where patient education is delivered. And the safe recovery program that we originally delivered has been probably translated in over, at least my last count will be over 100 hospitals around the world, but always at an individual level. It's very rarely that it's gone across in a systematic way. But different geriatricians, different nurses, different allied health have contacted myself or Terry over the years and said, oh, I'd love to start this program. And they've started running it. And we know that the program runs very well in East Metro at Bentley Hospital. And, you know, we know that they um, are doing well with, um, you know, their force prevention program. But why is it challenging to just go, OK, why don't we just all do it? Isn't it like a pill that you can just start giving it to everyone? I think because it forces us to reconceptualize falls prevention, instead of it being a thing, it, it becomes an interactive, maybe you could call it a messy intervention. It places the patient at the center of care and ourselves needing to communicate with the patient. And that requires changes of existing practice in a cultural way. And, and that practice change is hard to do. And it requires patient engagement and leadership. So it really requires an older person to come to hospital knowing they'll be asked to 
do something in inverted commas. Well, if you're sick, how are you going to do anything? It's a, you can see it. It's kind of simple, yet it can be challenging, as is any health behaviour change. Sometimes I think back or when I was a much younger person and the concept of seatbelt and how many of us uh, in my day uh, drove cars that didn't have seatbelts or there were no seatbelts in the back or there was a seat belt, but it was broken, and so you just drove along. And I think over the years of how we've moved from no seat belts, seat belts, everyone's got seat belts. Now there's special car, car seats for children with special seat belts, and we've now got airbags going along. So it's been a kind of a gradual translation. And I think that's the element of hospital care when we talk comprehensive care for patients as well. So, you know, why why education and why is it important that um, we look at education? I guess I, I would just use what I think is a kind of a very simple slide. And um, I've tried this slide before in many settings. And I, it's a, such a fundamental thing to me that I think uh, most nursing staff, physios on wards have no trouble conceptualising it that the things that we know will prevent falls is if people ring the bell when they need help, use walking aids, if we help patients with toileting, if we ask them to report symptoms, if we deal with delirium early. So when we, when we do those behaviours, we know falls will stop. But what's the single thing that's very important about all those behaviours? You need the patient to do them. You as a nurse, much as you are being safe, you're looking after your patients. As a physio, you're doing a fabulous job looking after your patients. You as an individual person, no matter how challenging this statement is, I can only say I feel it's true. You cannot go and ring the bell for every patient of yours. You can't do it. You have to somehow get them to understand to ring the bell. And that's the concept of patient education, isn't it? I can have all the seat belts in a car I like. I can do everything I can. I can make it a law. I can give people large fines if they don't have a seat belt. But I, even if I were the Minister for Transport in Australia or WA or wherever, I cannot go round and make everyone put their seat belt on. And that's why patient education and doing it well is so fundamentally important because it's the actions of patients that are going to stop falls. Now, I'm sure that can possibly sounds a bit challenging and you can see that I've got very kind of like, wow, this is such an interesting thing. But I think it is a really important thing for us to understand because then we'll be able to help our patients to understand it. I want to just throw in a little side issue that this is some data we published from a very large US database that I uh, led with Professor Shaw. And I think we're the first people to show, We I think we all know this, but I think we're the first people to show and publish data that falls happen very early in people's hospital stay. And this is data from medical and surgical wards. So whatever we do when we start to talk to patients, we have to do it soon. We have to do it when they come in. We have to do it as soon as we can because people fall early. They fall when they first arrive at places. So that's a kind of an important concept to have. It's also interesting in our systematic review, which we spent a long time doing, I can assure you, um, we found that interventions where multifactorial strategies showed some evidence usually included things like patient and staff education and responses to call buttons and regular toileting and things that involve interaction with patients. So um, I think that's an important supportive point. So thinking about patient education a little more closely now and um, you know why it's important and, and how can we do it. One of the first things and important things to remember, I could give you a whole talk on this, is a big thing is to first alert most older people to the fact that falls are not an accident. And that's still a, a prevalent perception among people. So if you were to get in a car 
and you had no idea that there were ever such a thing as a car accident, you wouldn't necessarily see that much importance to putting on your seatbelt. But in fact, we all know the serious problem that cars accidents have, and it's very well publicised. So we know that they're not accidents. We know that car, car accidents mostly happen because people have either not paid attention or they're driving too fast or there's some sort of serious issue. This is the trouble with falls prevention. When you look around at older people, they still, there is a prevalent feeling of falls being something that just happened, who knows why, it's just an accident. You know, you can't do much about it. Whereas the health professionals, we know that falls are largely due to risk factors and many of them can be addressed to significantly reduce down the risk of falling. So there's a mismatch there. And that's one of the first roles of patient education, alerting people to that mismatch. We have to think about the behaviour we want people to have. If we want people to put on their seatbelt, we need to make sure they feel motivated to do that and that they've got a seatbelt, they've got the opportunity to put their seatbelt on, they're not in an old ancient car with no seatbelt, and that they know how to do it and they're capable of doing it and they feel they're aware of it. And it's the same with false prevention in hospital. If you want your patient to behave safely, you have to tell them about falls. You have to tell them directly about falls and how to prevent them. You have to tell them immediately up front why certain things are done in hospitals. You have to get them to feel confident and able to take the action. You, you know, why do only three to 10% of patients ring the bell when nurses go around all day saying to people, please ring the bell? Why aren't people ringing the bell? Why aren't they feeling confident and motivated to ring their bell? And thirdly, people need the supports to take the action. So if they're going to be told, now remember, Anne-Marie, you need to use your walking frame. And I think to myself, gosh, yes, I should use my walking frame. The walking frame needs to be where I can get it. If I can't get it, I can't get out of bed without it or I get out of bed unsafely. So that's our one second nature lecture on health behaviour change. But it's important because all patient education for any condition, not only falls, needs to be designed in this way. It's why the best health promotion programs work. They work because they're designed well. And I just want to alert you to um, just a cut, really very brief example, because I want to give a little bit of time to talk about education. And that is that um, when you look at, we did a, a recent scoping review as part of our NHMRC partnership grant, and it's been um, received very, very well. And we looked at 43 articles. This was led by Hazel Heng, who's now got her PhD, Hazel, in the area of force prevention. And we found that of 43 articles, um, 11 studies used patient education as a single intervention, but other studies used it as part of, um, part of uh, other um, interventions. And we found that patient education reduced falls and improved knowledge and empowered patients to reduce their risk of falls. So patient education programs that worked were designed well and, and worked. And just in contrast, um, there's recently been, as you'll probably all know, a large trial, a very well run randomized control trial with people wearing wearable sensor vests using um, the Ambigen sensor apparatus. And that didn't show any significant difference in false outcomes. So I think we really need to look carefully at providing good quality patient education because we know it works. I think that's an important point. What are the successful ingredients we found in our scoping review? Well, it, most good patient education programs include an individualised risk assessment. That is not a long thing, but that means instead of telling every older person a generic message, you need to tell older people individually about falls risk and why it's relevant to them. So that's, uh, you know, we don't have time to go into that today, but it's an important point. We need to use good combinations of, of education delivery. So either little videos, pictures, um, little snippets, 
Spin. Dialogue, what? those kind of things. And we've just got a bit of background noise here. I think someone's undone their mute. So um, we just need to, whoever's undone their mute needs to pop it back on. Um, most patient, most um, programs will be most effective when they use theories of health behavior change and they incorporate active learning. So that's, it's a very important point. And again, we could discuss this slide for ages, but we'll, we'll move on. But at a follow up point, it'd be good for us to talk more about the how exactly of education. So I just want to give you some new data. We've been talking to older people and their caregivers in WA, and we've, we've asked um, older people to meet with us who have been in hospital anywhere in WA. We've got people from a wide variety of hospitals in the past couple of years, and we want to hear their experiences. And we've been talking to them online and in focus groups. And here's someone having an experience uh, talking about being in uh, a hospital. And you can see this person has said they fell over in the hospital. Um, they went, uh, they had gone in with a fall and they had um, fallen over again in the hospital. And you can read that little story there. And I'm sure you're all thinking, I know just how that happened. Now, why did that happen? That's that's kind of the real nub of it, isn't it? That that fall really shouldn't have happened, should it? Like it. You can see that's really a preventable fall. Why did that person get up with their broken elbow and their medications? What were they doing? What were they doing the first day they were in bed and they had a broken elbow and must have been so wobbly still? You know, what's happened there? You can really see that somewhere where I'm thinking myself, ooh, did that person get a really good dialogue about what they should be doing there? Here's, um, I think, a good example of communication mismatch. This is from a carer, a, a lady who cared for her mother, you know, and, you know, her mother fell in hospital and she's saying, you know, her fall was in the bathroom in hospital and she cracked her skull and she did some pretty serious damage. And then here's the part I think shows that communication and people were more angry with her. Um, they said, when, once she was in bed, they said, why didn't you wait? And this lady went on to say, well, wait for what? Like, I don't, why were people angry? Because she was going to the toilet. So there was a mismatch because staff had obviously thought this lady will understand and she'll wait for help or she'll ask for help. And the lady had obviously got up herself and hadn't asked for help. And now the family member is distressed and thinks, well, wh what do you mean? I, I, you know, why are you being so angry? Like, what are you meaning we were supposed to do? Isn't it, you know, you're supposed to be looking after it. You can see there's so much behind that story, can't you, of why the person fell. And interestingly, um, you know, when we talk to people about, well, do you know, did you feel you were safe in hospital? These are the kind of stories that are coming out. Well, another carer, you know, her mother, she got very wobbly on her feet, but there was never, never really anybody to help her. So, you know, this person goes on to say, so, you know, well, she just sort of had to get up. And another uh, man said to us, well, you know, who had surgery said, well, you know, I had a lot of bottles and bits dragging around, um, but, you know, there was nobody to help me. You had to do it on your own. Now, I'm 100% sure that the ward he was on they would have been saying to him, now, by the way, um, John, um, if you need help, please let us know. But obviously, he hasn't picked up on that message at all, has he? And he certainly hasn't picked up that that could be a risky thing for him to do. He's even said, I've stumbled a few times, but he, the nurse is probably conscientiously think, now I've told him if he needs any help to let me know immediately. Yet what's, what's happening here? Why isn't he taking on that behaviour? And remember too, uh, you know, when we think about people's perspectives and yes, very true, Kylie, he might have called but no one answered. That's a very, very true comment. That's another very common, frequent thing people have been saying to us in the focus groups. And um, remember, you know, I was talking about context that you might talk to undergraduates and when you talk to them, you say, oh, by the way, you've got to, you know, be strong on false prevention here. And you can sometimes be astonished, I know I can, when students will say to me, oh, why? And you think, oh, my gosh, they don't even realise falls are a problem. And they're here doing their placement. And, you know, this is what older people said to us Well, when we talked to them about falls. Well, you know, 
we think we're pretty tough. You think we're even after you being in hospital, you think you're fine. And this other person said, well, uh, who had been feeling very wobbly, said, well, I said I'm OK to do it on my own. Um, no, they never spoke to me about the risk of falling. So when people come into hospital, they're thinking, well, I'm still my normal self, aren't I? They're unlike you as a staff member who are like, that person has this condition, has a fever, is on new medication. I can see they are very unsafe to move around. But that person is still thinking, I'm just my normal self, Anne-Marie, who's come into a hospital. I'm no different. I, I'm not a medical person, so I haven't necessarily thought my broken elbow and those pain pills will make me wobbly. I, that's not kind of the way I'm going to think. And when we ask people about what sort of education they'd had, you see, these were very common messages we got. Most people in our focus groups and on our interviews were quite uh, blank about it. They said, no, I don't think anybody ever spoke to me about falling. Um, I didn't really think it was an issue. I asked some people in focus groups as a bit of a prompt, did, did you ever see any signs about force prevention and things? And a couple of patients uh, or consumers, because they're ex-patients then, commented to me, well, you know, one was quite astonished that I would ask it and said, oh, but hospitals are just so full of signs. I can't, I, I, I was so overwhelmed. I didn't see any, I wouldn't be able to tell you if there was any fall signs. So again, you know, the perception of a patient is very different to us. And here's another interesting comments from people. And um I think these are all very revealing. You know, his, there was one person uh, who we talked to who said, you know, it was very clear. They were told by the physio they were at risk and they were given some good instructions and they followed them and they were very complimentary about the fact that, oh, no, I was really told about it. I, I followed those things. You know, they were very conscientious and very happy with the instruction they'd received. Another a few people who said to us, well, people did they ring the bell? And they weren't quite sure why, but they'd been told, yes, you should ring the bell. Um, there was another person who commented on the fact there were often boards or this was a person who'd been to hospital a lot and commented, said, oh, there's sort of boards up, but they don't much write on them. And, you know, they were thinking that would have been quite a good thing, but no one used them much and they thought that would be quite a good idea to do. We showed people a video and uh, about falls and, you know, obviously we got some of these sorts of comments. You know, one person said, I learned more today from you than I've learned in hospital and through my doctor. So once you actually tell people about hospital falls, it usually a penny drops and they go, oh, wow, I had no idea of any of that. Um, and of course, here's the gaps in communication. Um, when we began to talk to people about, you know, have you thought about safety? Have you thought about... That could be why they're telling you to ring the bell. Then these kind of comments came back very frequently. You know, well, the nurses are very busy, you know, really busy. You can't just call them. And, um, uh, you know, the comment of they can't come running in every time you need a hand. So, you know, it's our patients are kind of making the decision for us. They're, they're kind of thinking, oh, well, of course, I've been told to ring the bell, but um, you know, I should just obviously do it myself if I can. And so you can see those mismatches approaching, can't you? And I can see a little comment about the video and I'm coming to that very shortly on my slide. Um, and so interestingly, with our later work we did with Hazel in Melbourne, um, talking to patients, um, patients that hadn't received any education. So they were on a ward where there wasn't a, there was pamphlets given out and there were there was a video shown on a screen sometimes. So there was education as such and nurses did risk screening, but most patients didn't perceive that they received anything formal that they understood about falls. And, and quite a few mentioned this concept of they, they would like more direction on how to talk about it and they would like more education. And that really contrasts, you know, in our study in, in Perth where we provided people with education, they said, wow, this education is good. It's made me more confident to speak up. So you can see that we've opened a line of communication there. And I think it's probably just important to say that um, un unprompted by us, experiences of ageism came up. And I think that's important to mention because ageism is what makes um, older people behave in ways in hospital that 
may not be the way we'd like them to behave. This concept of you get put into the older person category. It was like you get to a certain age and you've got certain conditions and it's all over. That sort of makes me quite angry, one person said. So there's that concept, um, people, uh, the, these kind of themes led on to people talking about. So I sort of thought, well, I have to prove I can do it myself. I have to show that I'm not old and past it, you know. Um, and people were conscious of they didn't feel staff spoke to them. They felt staff sort of stereotype them and someone commented it's like people think you've left your brain at the door so those are all things that are going to dissuade patients from talking to us if they think that we're we're stereotyping them as you know you're just an older person and you won't know much you know so that's that's an important point I think we have recently with one hospital um, design redesigned our our education so video we were showing people um Frida, was the new video we've made and contains our fundamental effective messages we think but it's just updated and contains a new workbook and we've been just testing that with the hospital and we've also just um showing it to our consumer focus groups and um so we're happy with it being very updated now and just we feel contains the latest information which is good and is also just presented well so um, that's the video that we're looking to um, test out in in future grants as well as well as just implement and again it it gives that simple message it it tries to give people that orientation of setting very simple goals of telling them about safe mobility it identifies cognitive problems so it, it creates straight away a system whereby we know who can listen and who might need more help so that's really good and it helps develop those feedback loops so it's that, that kind of fundamental process i think it's just really important to remember and i'm trying to finish up quickly so that you um uh, get time for some questions and we get time for dis some discussion um that patients Patients' thoughts and feelings are the main reason they fall. Um, it's the key reason they take risks because they are thinking they can do something that they may not be able to or they're thinking that it's important they behave in a certain way. If you don't discuss, you cannot know someone's thoughts and feelings without a discussion. And that's the single other biggest argument for patient education that if you don't say to your patient how are you going has anybody told you about fall risk then if the patient goes no you now can start to talk to them if the patient goes yes but I don't think it's that important you've got a discussion point you, unless you ask the patient you can't open a true dialogue you can't get into their thoughts and feelings and so just some simple tips when you want to talk to patients about falls is you don't need to spend large amount of time you need to spend a small amount of quality time so you need to spend only a minute or two but you need to ask questions not tell people things you need to use plain simple non-medical language and then you need to use nice adult concepts of uh, using pictures if need be provide simple information use teach back techniques encourage questions listen rather than speak it doesn't take a lot longer but it requires a real mindset and so I'm going to finish now so we can um, have some discussion but I hope I've uh, stimulated some thought and uh, um, discussion there uh, thank you very very much that was a wonderful presentation